I want to I want to start by reading you an entry from my journal, a personal journal, and it's dated February the 15th, 2003, 8 p.m. 2003, and here's what I wrote. I wanted to write and record some of the things that are going on in my family and in my soul. I sold the boy's donkey today, Jake and Luke's donkey. I think it was even more emotional for me than for them. I definitely cried more than them, though they never saw it. I've been wanting to get rid of that donkey ever since I got him. <laughs> and there's a reason I didn't want him to start with. We went to this horse sale, sale barn, just for entertainment. But my kids and then my wife started started insisting that we just had to get this long-eared, brawny back, long, yellow, yucky teeth donkey for $50. And I just happened to have $50. And you know, that's a sign, isn't it? When you got just the right amount of money. So, paid the $50, took that donkey home, and my boys immediately fell in love. Bonded with little Jake and little Luke. Jake was four. Luke was two. They were the only ones who could even catch him. Because they were the only ones he liked. Everybody else he hated. Especially me. Every time I went to feed him, he would try to kick me. And he was successful several times. A little, some, a couple from the church came over and they brought their cute little girl and she wanted a pony ride and that rascal bucked her off in the mud. And I just decided after three months, we just can't keep doing this. This, this should have never started in the first place. You know, sometimes the worst mistake or the worst sin is not ending something. It's that you ever started it in the beginning. But I knew it was going to feel pretty sinful and pretty low down to sell that donkey my boys loved. And yet I just had to reason with them. Actually, a two-year-old, you can't reason. So I just talked to Jake, my four-year-old. And I, I recounted, reminded him what all, all the bad things that had happened. And here's the main thing I said to him. I said, Jake... I know it's hard for you to understand, but we just don't need that donkey anymore. And I said it again. Jake, we just don't need that donkey anymore. And surprisingly, he accepted that. He didn't fuss. He didn't cuss. He didn't cry. He cooperated. We put an ad in the newspaper. Two men, believe it or not, two dummies came all the way from another county, brought the trailer, horse trailer with them. Now, they meant business. And I knew we had him sold. Well, they pulled up to the pasture, pasture gate, and Jake, my four-year-old, that sweet little fella, walked out there himself and caught his donkey by the halter and led him back to those men. And they took it from there. And they pulled him around up onto the trailer. And, and as the donkey was hopping up on the tra trailer, Jake even slapped him in the behind. <laughs> and I was amazed. I, I was amazed that he could let go like that. And that he trusted me like that. But then something strange happened that I still don't understand. As soon as the donkey loaded, Jake took off walking in the opposite direction. He, he started walking out toward the road by himself. He was walking along the path that the trailer with his donkey was going to be passing. They'd be passing him any minute. And the men... Slammed the gate, cranked up the truck, rolled 
in that direction. And I picked up my little boy, Luke, and I started walking toward Jake. Something was just drawing me to him. But I didn't get there in time to talk to him before the trailer with his donkey passed. All I was able to do is see him from a distance. As his donkey passed out of sight for the very last time, he wasn't, he wasn't crying. No. Wasn't saying anything. He was just standing. Just standing and looking. He looked like the little boy from where the red fern grows when little Ann got killed. And I rushed to him and I scooped him up. There was a time I could pick up both of my boys <laughs> and carry him. And I carried him back toward our truck. And as we walked, Jake said to me, You know what, Daddy? We didn't need that donkey anymore. And after he said that, I couldn't talk anymore. Because I knew what would happen when he said that. He was repeating my own words back to me. Not sarcastically. He was too young to be sarcastic or even know how to be. He was just saying, Daddy, you must be right. We let him go because we don't need him anymore. Hmm. And that made me want to just get in the world. And not because of guilt, like you think. Though, well, though that was part of it, okay. <laughs> but mainly because I saw in him an example I needed to follow with my own father. When my father puts a hand on something I care about and don't want to let go, and he says, we just don't need that anymore. There he stood. There he stood. So helpless. So small. And he could not understand. And yet, he trusted that daddy did understand. And that made all the difference. When I think about things like that, when I see little children and get to interact with them, I, I understand more and more why Jesus used children as an example the way he did in more than one place. But 10, Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse... 14, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. What strong language. It didn't say they're in danger of not entering if they're not like a little child. He didn't say they may not enter. He's, he just plainly said they don't receive the kingdom of God like a little child. They will not enter. You ever wonder why that is? What was it about little children that impressed Jesus so much why would he say that about them? You've got to be like them. As I said earlier, God that day was saying to me, Lance, you need to pay attention to this little boy you're raising here. You're his teacher. But he just taught you something mighty important. He taught you one of the most important lessons in the Christian faith, and that is how to let go. Because listen, folks, you cannot follow Jesus Christ without letting go of a whole lot of stuff. Sometimes you have to let go of something right at the very beginning. 
If you're like me and you came to Christ when you were just a little kid, you probably didn't have to let go of much at the beginning. It came later. But I can tell you this, it won't ever stop. Because as long as you keep following Christ through this world, you're going to find one thing and then another and then another that you've got to turn loose. And you've got to be able to just say, God, it hurts. But I guess we just don't need that anymore. You see, Jesus understood that you cannot enter the kingdom, you cannot live the spiritual life, you cannot follow Jesus unless you learn to let go. And that's not natural for us. We, by nature, are clingers. We're holder owners and we're hoarders. And we naturally want to get and keep as much of everything we like and hold on to as much of it. But Jesus was always telling people, let go of that. You don't need that anymore. Leave it behind. Leave it behind. Truth is, all of those things that God asked you and me to let go of have one thing in common. They are always, always, always things that you will eventually have to let go of anyway. And what he's asking you to do is trust him enough to let go now. Now. And if you try to hold on to things, once life is taking them away, it's God and, and life, God and reality will conspire together. They will work together to shape you into Christ's likeness through circumstances like losing somebody you thought you couldn't live without. Losing a position that was your whole identity and you don't even know who you are if you're not the boss anymore or the president anymore. Don't you see it with actors and athletes all the time who don't realize when they reach the point that they don't need that anymore? When they get to the point where their athletics have taken them as far as it's going to take them. Their young good looks have taken them as far as it's going to get them. They can't let go. Sometimes they keep playing, they keep performing, and they actually put a taint on their legacy because they held on too long to something that had to go. Jesus taught us that if we will learn to let go, we will have a much more joyful life, a whole lot more peace. Do you know what robs us of peace and joy? One of the big robbers, the big thieves that steals peace and joy, it's our frantic attempts to hold on and cling to things that we just can't hold on to. As we get older, it's our health. And I'm not saying I'm old. But I've had just enough back trouble, which is doing well now, by the way. But I've had enough to know what it feels like to wake up and feel really old. And to not be able to do the stuff I used to do. And I don't like that. And I bet nobody in this place is going to like it, but everybody in this place is going to be there. And you better start getting ready to let go. Don't hold too tightly to anything. If you hold too tightly to anything, it's just going to cause you a lot of unnecessary suffering when it's pride from your grip. Learn to get in the habit of holding things lightly. Hold even relationships lightly. 
Basically, if it's a noun, hold on to it lightly. If it's a person, it's a place, it's a thing, you won't always have it. And I'm not saying get rid of it prematurely. I'm saying you need to go ahead and start getting ready to let go. Jesus, listen to what he said, Luke 17 and verse 3. He, he says, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you let your life go, you will save it. You want to see a, a picture of a person who let their life go and they saved it by letting it go. You ever, you ever met or do you know a graceful elderly woman whose white hair is like a crown and she dresses not like a teenager but like who she is? And she's not afraid to tell you her birthday. And she's not embarrassed by her wrinkles. She's at peace. That woman has caught hold of something far more precious than young looks. She's got hold of Christ. And she's following in the way of Christ who's constantly saying, you got to turn loose. Turn loose. If you turn loose, you'll find real life. Jesus, in his ministry, was always doing this. He so told some people, leave your home. Other people, leave your family, your position, your possessions. You're familiar with that stuff. But here's some other things you got to leave behind that maybe you haven't thought about. Sometimes what Christ wants you to leave behind is your past. Let go. Don't cling. Let it go. And I'm talking about your past sins that he's already tired of talking about and wishes you would shut up about it and move on. Let go of your past and past sins that have already been forgiven and also past hurts that came from other people. If you hold on to them, on to them you will find yourself stuck. In a miserable life. Forgiveness itself is, is really just a way of letting go. Sometimes we've got to let go of unhealthy relationships. And I don't just mean, I do mean, but I don't just mean some good teenage girl dating a bad teenage boy. That's only one of a thousand applications. Have you ever seen parents? Have you ever seen parents who still try to control their grown children. And they do all they can to keep those children dependent on them. They will even enable those kids to keep them close, to keep them dependent. And though they would never admit it to themselves or acknowledge it even, some of that is an attempt to control. You see, when you don't trust God enough, you're going to find yourself trying to control somebody else. You hear that? When you don't trust God enough, you will find yourself trying to control somebody else who you hope is going to make up the difference when God lets you down. In the same way, you can flip flop this parent thing around. There are a whole lot of grown kids, 15-year-old, 40-year-olds, who still expect way too much from their parents. And sometimes it's the child who can't let go. Oh, you know what the worst in the world is? The hardest to break out of is when neither one can let go. But somebody's going to die here eventually. Somebody better start learning to let go. You got to let go of unhealthy relationships. And sometimes healthy ones too. One good thing I can tell you, at least, at least God does not require you to give up all the different things at once. I mean, that would be overwhelming, wouldn't it? Let's say over the course of your life, part of your training as a disciple, part of the chipping away process that's forming you into a Christ-like person, if part of all that is a certain number of surrenders, 
letting goes, then you're not going to get where God wants you to get without embracing and accepting those things. But thank God, they usually don't come all at once. That, that, with my son, for example, Jake, that was enough right there. Set, getting, get selling his donkey was all I, I knew that's all he could handle that day. But I've had to say no, and he's had to say the goodbye to a whole lot of other things since that day. And on that day, what he couldn't understand is how much I loved him and how much I wanted to do good things for him. My goodness, if you got a kid, you know how quick you would die for that child, and you got a Savior, Christ, the Son of God, who died for you, who gave it all up, who let it all go. You don't get any more helpless than hanging on a cross with both your hands nailed out beside you and your feet nailed below you. You, you're not going to kick anybody in the head like that. You're just going to strain for your next breath, pushing up on the nails and then sink back down. Jesus gave that up. Jesus gave it up, and sometimes we have to do the same. Now, the brightest news is that sometimes when God asks you to let go of one thing, it is because he's making room for another thing. And... And it often doesn't take a whole long time for that next thing to come along. I want to show you some pictures. Several years after Jake let go of his donkey, I asked him one day, Jake, can I tell some people in a sermon about your story? And he said, oh, yeah, Daddy, you can tell them all about that. And he said, you can tell them that it turned out really well because now I've got two horses and one saddle and one cart. You see, Jesus is not out to make you miserable. He's actually trying to protect you from self-inflicted misery that comes when you can't let go. He said in John 10.10, 10, the, thief, the thief comes to steal, kill, destroy. I come. My purpose is to give them that's you, his purpose. He wants to give you a rich, satisfying life. Trouble is, we have our conception of what a rich, satisfying life is. And what all we would have to have and hold on to and manage to keep in order to have a rich, satisfying life. Truth is, we're like four-year-olds who think we know best. And I'm not shaming you for feeling that way. We all do when the time comes to let go. But my goodness, it's going to happen. Letting go, letting go. Learn to treat it like Jesus. Many times, the reason God is allowing you to lose something that you want to keep it's not because he wants to give you something better. Well, let me rephrase that. He's always going to give you something better, but it's not always going to be something physically better, something tangible, a better horse, a better car, a better wife, whatever. Sometimes he's doing it for the most important reason of all. He's, it's to bring you into the experience that Jesus Christ himself had. This is the most important scripture of the day. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. And then we'll go down to verse 32. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders and the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. And he would be killed. But three days later, he would rise from the dead. 34. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, he said, and he still says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. Remember how we said in order to take up a cross, you 
You may have to let go of something else to follow Him. You must leave something else. Look at this next verse. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give it up, if you give up your life for my sake and the sake of the good news, you'll save it. What did Jesus do? What, what did He do? To, he went down willingly. Get this now. Jesus went down willingly without a fight, without trying to run away. He went down willingly because he trusted God to raise him up. The more you trust God, the more confident you are in his ultimate determination to bless you, the easier it is to let go of your life. Jesus gave up control, laid it down. I surrender my will. Oftentimes, the thing is not merely something you're asked about ahead of time, the way I asked Jake. The saddest, the toughest, the most shocking, painful things in life are when we don't get asked first. It just happens. And we learn about it from a horrible phone call in the night or a terrible pathology report. We don't always get asked first. But Jesus Christ taught us what to do. He taught us how to operate when it comes time to lay down our life. Listen, He taught us how to operate, what to do, how to respond when you're called upon to lay down part of your life or all of your life. You lay it down as He did. Do you realize that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is much, much more than just a doctrine to believe in? Now, I believe He died and rose again, and I bet you do too. And as I've said before, I bet every devil in hell believes that because it is true. But there's no way in hell that any devil is going to follow the pattern of Jesus Christ and actually surrender, actually let go, actually say, God, I give it up. Nothing in my hands I bring, only to your cross I cling. Now folks, what's your, what's your cross? Some of you are already bearing the pain of it. And your challenge is to accept it. And I'm not telling you that if you just grit your teeth and strain, you'll be able to accept what now seems so unacceptable. Chances are you can't. You're going to need some help. You're going to need to talk to some people, some professional people that know how to help you. And if you don't, then you get to keep your sorrow. Maybe what you need to let go of is your pride. Or your own way of thinking that you've got to handle it. Let go. What's your donkey? Whatever it is, what I want to ask you to do today is slap that donkey on the hind end and say, Father, we didn't need that donkey anymore, did we? Because the truth is, bad as it hurts, bad as you miss it, you don't. You're still alive. You're still breathing. You're still living and moving. And your life's not over. Let go and move on.